Hi, I'm DC Brakes and I'm here at DBS Institute for Industry Week and I'm going to be talking about my career as a DJ and producer and how I've developed a number of different revenue streams working in the music industry. So Halo was a plug-in, as I said, it's a bit of a, um, a pandemic project that Dan and I uh, worked on, and um, it's a hybrid synth rompler plugin. So what that means is it combines elements of synthesis. So you can see very faintly here, there's a, a synth layer, there's a sub layer, and then there's a sample layer. So I guess in terms of what we, or why we kind of went into developing it, we wanted to create a unique tool that no one else had kind of made before in a way. Like there's obviously lots of synths out there, there's lots of samplers or romplers where the sounds are kind of baked in but you can't change them. And so we wanted to create kind of almost like an open synth rompler hybrid. Um, and one of the reasons for us is that the way that we tend to write our music or make, make the sounds, the bass sounds particularly, is to kind of create a bass sound layer it maybe with a sub if, it, if it's lacking a little bit in the low end for a kind of clean low end. Um, maybe sometimes you feel like you need to fill it out with some additional synth layers and then kind of process that and kind of modulate all of that stuff kind of together. And so that was kind of the design rationale behind it. And we also wanted it to be independent of third parties and to serve as a revenue stream. And what I mean by that is that one of our main revenue streams for digital products was sample packs or synth preset packs. And so like Serum synth preset packs was something that we did a lot of. Um, but you're kind of reliant on that, that, uh, that third party synth. So we wanted to make something like that that we could create our own products for. So there's a product itself that people buy, but then longer term also add on additional um, sort of uh, basically sample packs uh, that is kind of, you know, baked into the actual uh, plugin. So the way that we kind of approached it was that Dan was kind of had this idea for the sampler. Uh, he kind of went out and kind of got into the coding side of things. I designed the GUI, uh, it's graphic, graphic user interface, and we wanted it to kind of feel like coherent with our brand as well so that we, we thought having it as a DC break product was going to help ideally try and sell it. And yeah, we wanted it to be fairly intuitive to use. So the idea is that most of the controls that you might want to use are kind of right there. Uh, it ended up growing and becoming a lot bigger and a lot more complicated. So um, we maybe didn't quite nail that. But the idea is that if you click on, a, on any of these tabs, you will then um, you get a more detailed display in the middle where you can go into more detail in terms of how you set up your LFOs or all the other parts, essentially. Um, so for those of you who might be considering this at some point in your career, um, one of the things that we didn't really do was consider what different platforms there were in, in that greater detail. Dan just came across and just started working in it. But there's so many different ways that you can approach coding and developing. But in the end, it came down to using this one called Highs, which is based on something called Juice. I can't tell you about it because I did, not, did none, of the, <laughs> none of the coding. Um, but depending on what platform you use, if you want to then start selling it, you might need to think about how much it's going to cost to license that, uh, that software. Um, what ability you have uh, as a coder, like we had, well, Dan had none, so he was learning everything from scratch. Um, luckily, the forums around Hives were really good, and he was able to really like find out a lot from just asking other people, and people were quite willing to help out in that respect. So that was kind of things that made it um, a bit easier for us. And um, and then yeah, there's things like compatibility in terms of uh, what you know iOS or. Um, uh, you know, uh, operating system we're talking about, and then uh, also what functionality you can kind of build into it. But essentially, Juice as a, as a foundation can, you know, you can do pretty much anything that you want to do. Um, so yeah, so this is something that we had like no idea about, but it's something to, to bear in mind if you're developing a plugin. It's the software development cycle. So you start with perhaps a requirement analysis, which was our motivation. You know, we wanted to make this tool that was, uh, you know, unique and all the rest of it. You then start to design it and then build it and then test it. So a big part of it was kind of Dan would send me a working version. I'd go through, find all the bugs, tell him about them. He'd go away, pull his hair out, try and figure out how to fix them. And then eventually we would kind of evolve the product and then kind of, you just kind of go around in that cyclical fashion, um, developing the product as you go along. It's not just a case of design it and then it's done. It's kind of, it's a, a continually evolving uh, process. Um, so I think this will play without sound, yeah. So, in terms of marketing it, 
what we wanted to do was to kind of leverage our network. So over the years, having toured with like most of the DJs in the scene, we had a kind of immediate, like low hanging fruit network of other producers who we could give it to. Quite a few of them like, like Leveller, Prolix and other people were kind of testing it for us and giving us like feedback on the design, what functionality they kind of wanted to have in it. And then um, getting them to shout about it, they gave us kind of endorsements for our website and then we would kind of also get them to shout about it on social media. So we had, in a quite short space of time, we were able to get the message out to a big chunk of uh, the drum and bass world, um, in at least on a sort of social media level. And then we would do things like, uh, well, actually, uh, you might see down here, oh, sorry, I wasn't ready to go back then. <laughs> um, that's uh, Music Tech, so Music Tech Magazine reviewed it for us. I, I basically went through, tried to find as many of the like relative and content creators or editors for different um, publications like that uh, to get them to review it. Uh, they gave us a nine out of 10 score, which is great. So that was something we could shout about to try and give it some authenticity for people who didn't maybe you know, know what it was. And then we'd do things like you know, win a copy and just tag your friends into the post and all that sort of stuff to kind of get the post to get as much uh, reach as possible. Um, and then, yeah, so, oh, yeah, so here's the music tech uh, review. The other thing I then started doing, which I hadn't really done much of up to that point, was actually advertising. So the price point that we set was initially like £59 or something like that. So there was quite a good margin there to actually take some of that mon money and start experimenting with some marketing to see how sort of cost per click and kind of Google ad campaigns uh, came about um, and to start testing that to then start driving traffic through to develop sales. Um, and then the other thing that we did, so we wanted to kind of develop these expansion packs as a way of generating income over a longer term. And so once people had kind of bought it, we wanted to then be able to sell, you know, upsell them essentially on creating, uh, you know, new revenue streams by adding expansions. So that was a whole like other coding issue of like trying to get that to work. Um, and there were lots of issues around um, sort of piracy and content protection and things like that as well that we had to try and get our heads around, but we eventually managed it. And we were initially also going to try and sell it through Plugin Boutique, which you might know is like a pretty major plugin reseller. And the idea there is that they've obviously got massive like global reach. I think they have like a million uh, unique users every month. And it was a lot bigger audience than we were able to market to just within drum base and on our own customer base. Um, but in the end, it didn't end up happening. We had quite a few calls with them. What they wanted to do was to kind of white label it and also kind of use it as a, so it would become like uh, almost like that, a plugin boutique plugin um, or, or, or a DC Breaks plugin, but that they could then monetize in their own way. And also they wanted to kind of be involved with uh, some of the coding and it just became a bit messy. So we ended up deciding not to work with them initially and to kind of do like a soft launch and just kind of test the market, see how we got on with sales and then perhaps go back to them to kind of just work as a, uh, as a yeah, straight up uh, reseller or distributor. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you want to learn more about what it's like to work in the music industry, subscribe to the DBS channel now.